All right, let me have you open your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 15. Exodus 15. And I'm going to begin reading there at verse 11 down through verse 16. Exodus 15 and verses 11 through 16 as we get underway. We read, Who is like thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretched out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm they shall be as still as a stone. Till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. Now stop right there. Right away you can see from the scriptures that that they show God to be loving and protective of those who are dear to him. But he's a God of judgment to those who are not. Um, his deliverance of Israel out of Egypt by many miracles was intended to do at least two things. Number one, to win their loyalty to him. And also to strike fear in the hearts of all the other nations around them. Today I want to bring you a sermon, and it won't be lengthy, but hopefully it'll have some substance to it. And I call this God a balanced being. God a balanced being. The Bible says, Yet ye say, The way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? Ezekiel 18, verse 25. Many professing Christians today have a lopsided view of God. They can't imagine that God would get angry with men or at the wickedness he sees in the world. And they want to believe that God is so loving, he's so forgiving, he's so compassionate, he's so gracious and so long-suffering and patient with men that uh, he will grant every man an entrance into heaven someday, no matter what he believes. That's not true. This comes from saturating their, their minds with a kind of slop that's offered up by, by men like Robert Schuller years ago, and today Joel Osteen, Rick Warren, and all the other uh, shallow Christians, baby Christians, uh, who profess to be ministers of the gospel. They want to accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative. You, you can't go through life that way. It's kind of like these... Uh, young people, unfortunately, we don't have any people, uh, young people in our church of this corrupted mindset. But it's like these young people today, they're, they're 18, 19, 20, 21, they're in college, but they have to have a safe space. I'm an adult, but I need safe, I need protection. You might say something that hurts my feelings. Then I need a sort of a comfort doll or a dog to pet to make me feel better. Grow up! If you can't be trusted with somebody else's opinion, you can't be trusted with the right to vote either. I wouldn't trust you to drive a car down the street. You might think stop is an infringement. That's a trigger warning. Stop means go, right? I don't trust you to do anything. Go back to your home, complain to your dad and mom that they failed in raising you right, and then come back when you're about 35 and maybe you got some sense. But people want to listen to, to, to social sermons by lovely people who talk about how much they love other people and want other people to love them so they can pick their pockets. That's what it all comes down to. These guys that have mega churches and uh, multitudes of people swarming, they're not living poor, uh, poor mouth and hand to mouth uh, lives. They're not living paycheck to paycheck. They're not working hard to make sure they can afford their bills and cut corners where they need to and, uh, and make their expenses. They're living high in the hog, making millions of dollars. Millions, tens of millions in some cases. 
uh, that, that goofball uh, Kenneth Copeland, he, he brags that he's a billionaire. Now, I don't know, he was, they don't open their books to accountants very often, but uh, the best estimates that he's well over $700 million in personal wealth. Got his own airport, a fleet of jets and, and plane, private planes on his, on his property. Just like Jesus had. I mean, did you read that in the New Testament? This is how Jesus had. Jesus didn't have one donkey. He had a whole barn full of donkeys. Didn't you know that? But it's God's love that allows him to forgive the sins of a repentant sinner. Not just any sinner, a repentant sinner who understands his guilt and needs to be forgiven. But at the same time, it's his holiness that demands that every sin be punished. And um, you can either believe that all the sin in the world was paid for in the death of Christ at Calvary, and thus the, the grace of God can become yours. Or you can say, I don't believe that. I don't believe in your God or re your religion. I don't want any part of that. And then you'll end up suffering for your sin yourself one day. You either let him uh, trust that he's already suffered for you or take your chances in eternity and suffer on your own. But the sloppy, shallow, childish preaching offered by ministers, quote unquote, today only creates a, a generation of professing Christians who can't handle the challenges of the world. You know, there are a lot of things out there challenging the uh, gospel of Jesus Christ. There's the challenge of Islam. There's the challenge of Mormonism. There's the challenge of Catholicism. Catholicism is not a Christian church. They're the biggest cult in the world. There's the challenge of atheism. And I got to tell you, some milk toast uh, pansy like Joel Osteen wouldn't be able to handle any of those challenges. Larry King, who specialized in offering up softballs for people to hit, um, said, well, what about someone like me who's a Jew? If I don't believe in Jesus, uh, am I going to hell? Well, you know, Larry, I, I don't try to judge other people. I kind of let leave that up to God, and I don't want to get into specifics about it. What a pansy! The correct answer is, is to, would, be, would have been, Larry, as much as this pains me to say it, yes. It means that you are lost, and so is anybody else without Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So while it may not be pleasant to hear, and my, while millions of people watching on television might not like it, and they can send me hateful, e hateful letters, the truth of the gospel is that, yes, without Jesus Christ, every man is lost. It doesn't mean I ha harbor animosity towards you and want to make you my enemy in this life, but the truth of the scriptures are plain. That would have been the right answer. But you see, a guy who doesn't know the scriptures doesn't know how to answer a reason from the scriptures. The idea, the liberal idea, is that surely man is better than God. And if, if man hates somebody, God would never hate anybody. Or if man is sometimes able to forgive his enemies, surely God being better, than, he'll forgive all of his enemies, won't he? And you want to ask, why should he do that? What does God stand to gain by forgiving those that hate him? What does he stand to gain by letting them into heaven? Oh, they stand to gain everything, but what does God stand to gain? What, 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 on what basis should God forgive them when they, they haven't asked for it and all they've done is mock God? So let's consider what I call God a balanced being. First of all, point number one, let me say this. God is holy. God is holy. You can't really imagine a God who is not perfect and holy in every respect. He's free from impurity. He's uh, undefiled. There's no stain of defilement with God. He's the true essence of virtue. Because he has unlimited power, he can't be corrupted. There's nothing you can offer that would be able to bribe God for anything. He already owns it all. You don't even own it, ultimately. He owns it all. So there's nothing you have to give him that he doesn't already have uh, ownership of. It's hard to imagine a being like that, and yet that's the God of the Bible. That's the God that we serve. 
He's the summit of all wisdom, of all beauty, of all light and enlightenment. We're told, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined, Psalm 50, verse 1. And the prophet Habakkuk states, uh, Habakkuk 1, verse 13, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. The apostle John writes, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all, 1 John 1, verse 5. So our text correctly asks, in verse 11, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? He's so far above the corruptions that men uh, of this world, rather, and um, beyond the limitations of this human flesh. It's hard to conceive of that. And yet that's the God of the Bible. That's the God that every Christian comes to know when he trust Jesus Christ as his Savior. Listen to what the Mormon founder Joseph Smith said about their God. This is from April 1844, as recorded in their history of their church. God himself was once as we are now, and is an exalted man, and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret. If the veil were rent today, and the great God who holds this world in its orbit and who upholds all worlds and all things by his power was to make himself visible, I say if you were to see him today, you would see him like a man in form, like yourselves in all the person, image, and very form as a man. For Adam was created in the very fashion, image, and likeness of God and received instructions from and walked and talked and conversed with him as one man talks and communes with another. Numbers 23, 19 tells us God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. If God is still a man, then he must still be subject to the limitations of man. He must still be subject to the temptations of the flesh and the weaknesses of the flesh. But the God of the Bible is not like the God of the Mormons. Their God is a little g. In the Mormon religion, God lives inside his creation, somewhere out beyond a star called Kolob. They even have a hymn in the Mormon hymn book, uh, Canst Thou Hide to Kolob, meaning to, to go quickly to Kolob, and there where God dwells. And on that planet, beyond that star, somewhere, God lives with his multitude of wives uh, in some sort of spiritual, ethereal world, and there he's busy producing spirits with all of these wives. And those spirits are then sent to this earth to be born into the flesh and take on human form, and then try to figure out how to get back to God and become, become gods themselves. That's the Mormon theology. God of the Mormons lives inside his creation. Our God is outside of the creation. He's the one that made it. Before there was any universe, there was our God. Our God existed before time, space, matter ever existed. The God of the Mormons lives sometime, somewhere on a planet within his own creation. But Paul says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16, in the person of Jesus Christ. And then he says about Christ, that Christ made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man, Philippians 2.7. Well, that presupposes that God wasn't a man living in human form before that happened, right? That, that, that assumes that God wasn't uh, restricted to some human body before he came to this earth and took upon himself the form of a man. But he is beyond sin, he's beyond the flesh, he is incorruptible, God is holy. Secondly, let me say this, God is love. God is love. 1 John 4, 8 says, 
He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. God is love. Love isn't just a verb, you know, I love somebody else. But love is a noun. It's part of the description of God's essence. God is love. You'll never know true love until you know the true God. But if God lives in someone's heart by the new birth, by conversion, then that man or that woman must love God because God is indwelt by love. Love is part of the, the substance of God, if you will. Turn, if you will, to Psalm 5. Psalm 5. You can't appreciate the love of God until you realize what it is that makes God angry as well. Now, you can't know, you can't appreciate kindness, the kindness from somebody else, unless somewhere along the way you've experienced, uh, you know, the, the, the wickedness or the insult or injury done by someone else. Once you see, once you've experienced both of these things, you, it's pretty clear, I want this, I don't want that. But you can't appreciate the love of God until you know what it is, how, how it is, and why it is He bestows it, and what it is that makes Him angry. I don't want to be in the receiving end of His anger. I want to be in the receiving end of His love. Look at Psalm 5, and two verses there, verses 4 and 5. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee, the foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. He doesn't just hate their sins. He hates them. They've chosen to sin against God by their own free will. By their own free will. Look at Psalm 7. Psalm 7. And notice there one verse, verse 11. God judges the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked, Every day, something that men do makes them wicked, which makes a holy God despise them. It's called sin. Notice also over in Psalm 11 and verse 5. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth God's soul. You can't love cleanliness unless you hate dirt simultaneously. Both of them have to exist at the same time. So while the Bible tells us that God is love, and He wants to bestow love, He also hates sin, and He hates the sinners who commit it. The New Testament declares, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. Well, this creates a, a great moral dilemma for man. If by my sin I have earned the hatred of God and the anger of God and the eventual wrath of God, how can I possibly undo it and thus receive His love? This is where all religions begin. It's like the Philippian jailer asking Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved. What must I do to be saved? Everybody has this mistaken idea that if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, I'll go to heaven. But if my bad deeds outweigh my good deeds, I'll go to hell. I don't know how many ministers I hear during the week, ministers, priests, you name it, they say that basically the same thing. Live a good life and, and you'll get to heaven. Live a bad life and you'll go to hell. I had one Catholic priest, he's be passed away now, but his rhetoric was always, uh, it's time to dust off your resume. He was an Irish, you know, he had, have you dusted off your resume lately? Might be time to take it out and see uh, how your life is measuring up. That has nothing to do with it. Good deeds, bad deeds, none of that has anything to do with your salvation. That's not the standard. Imagine somebody who's, he lives to be 35 years old maybe 40 years old. He's lived for himself. He's really never given thought to helping other people or doing kind deeds or giving to charity or, you know, being a little selfless more often. He's never really thought of the, along those lines. 
he hasn't really, you know, he hasn't committed murder, he hasn't gone to prison for anything, but he's just been a self-centered person. So he, something inside him tells him, you know, maybe this is not all life has to offer. So he seeks out a religion and they tell him, you know, you need to live right, you need to do right, you need to act right, be kind and, and so forth, do all these good deeds. So he starts, sets out to start living a life where he's, he gives more money, he goes to church, he tries to be charitable, he tries to be kind to his neighbor, not, not argue with the, the guy who parked in, his, in front of his house when he should have parked in front of his own house. He doesn't get mad at any of those things. And he thinks, well, if I start doing good, then I'll accumulate enough good to tip the scales and that no you won't you're already 35 years behind how do you expect to catch up you can't but the coming of christ the, for, since the coming of christ the true answer is there's nothing you can do to be saved there's nothing you can do to earn god's love or to erase the consequences of your past actions nothing you can do but the God of the Bible, the God who is love, has fixed the problem for you, if you're willing. God. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live, and here's the qualifier, through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God. You know, man's efforts to love God, to impress God, are, are futile and self-serving but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 4, verses 9 and 10. The Bible says that God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It had nothing to do with you earning it, uh, pleasing God, justifying it, and so forth. While a holy God hates sin and he has a right to hate the sinner, because he's a God, because he's the God who, who made man, rather, and he wants to love man, he sent Christ, God in human form, to die on Mount Calvary for the sins of all men. And if you want to know and receive God's love, you have to go to Mount Calvary and get it. That's where he deposited it. And you can only go there by faith. Religion won't get you there. Giving money to charity won't get you there. Doing Deeds that seem to be good in the eyes of everyone around you won't get you there only by trusting what Jesus Christ did for you already I told these two ladies I was talking to this morning All the good in the world I can do will send me straight to hell All I can do is trust what Jesus Christ did for me He died as a substitute for he was a sacrifice on my behalf even before I was born He died for the sins that I would one day commit and he was already punished for them. That's how infinite the death of Jesus Christ uh, was to cover the sins of all men, of all time. But if you can do that by faith, uh, God is love. God wants to save you. Next, let me say this. Uh, the Bible tells us God is faithful. God is faithful. If you want to turn, turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> and we'll read the last two verses there. Verses 38 and 39. Romans 8 verses 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, notice, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is one of the great comforts of a child of God, because God keeps you saved. He does the saving, and He has to do the keeping. There's no way you can ever lose it. That sounds rather boastful to so many people. So many people go to church and they're being told week after week and year after year and decade after decade that you have to be a good person to gain your entrance into heaven. Somehow, some way, you have to either abide by the, the rules, the bylaws of the church, you have to obey the law, pay your income taxes. Well, you should do those things if you want to avoid prison. But 
and do those things, and this is how you gain entrance into heaven. They want to tip the scales in your favor one day. Uh, but you ask someone like that, do you know for sure if you died today, you'd wake up in heaven with Jesus Christ? And the best answer they can give is, I don't know. I don't think anybody can know for sure until they, they, they die and find out. What a, what a horrible way to live. I want to know right now that that insurance policy is going to pay off if my house burns down, right? Don't say, well, we think it will. You better have some, some proof, some ironclad proof that uh, everything's okay. Philippians 4 verse 19 says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Not all your greed, but all your need. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Philippians 1 verse 6, He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's God's faithfulness to the believer, the child of God, that that Christian has to depend upon. Hebrews 13 verse 6, So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. You know, it sounds great. It reads great on the page. But putting it into practice day after day is a different matter. Nevertheless, it's there. It's in the scriptures. It's true. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Ephesians 5 and verse 30 says, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. When a person trusts Jesus Christ, they don't just enter into an organization called the church. They become part of what the scriptures call the body of Jesus Christ. It's, it's constituted... Um, by all believers throughout the world who have trusted Christ to save them. They become part of that body of Jesus Christ. And then in 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. God does the saving. God does the keeping. He keeps you saved. You didn't do anything to, to earn your salvation, and you can't add anything to, to uh, keep your salvation. It's already completed. God, the Bible says, Ephesians 2, 6, God has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. That's right now. Either you, either you believe it and live like it, or you don't. That's between you and God. But part of you is already in the third heaven, waiting for these bodies to be transformed and your change to be made complete one day. You can either live like that, enjoy that promise, and say, I'm, I know for sure that I'm saved. I'm not waiting to pass some future test. I'm not waiting to avoid the Antichrist and the tribulation. I'm not depending upon how many good deeds I can do between now and whenever I die. I'm saved now. now. Why that concept escapes so many people, but it does. I guess it's so overwhelmingly, so, so overwhelming, uh, it's so simple. And yet it's true. People can't believe it. But I'm saved right now. And if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you're saved right now. Amen. And lastly, let me say this, point number four. God is merciful. The difference between grace and mercy is this. His grace is closely related to his patience, his long-suffering. You know, someone has defined grace and mercy this way. Grace <clears throat> is God giving you something that you don't deserve. The forgiveness of your sins, a home in heaven, the promise of eternal life. And mercy is what keeps God from giving you what you do deserve. Judgment, like a fire one day. So both of those things... Uh, come together in the life of a believer once he trusts Christ to save him. Uh, it's God's mercy that lets a man go on year after year after year rejecting the gospel, saying, I don't want Christianity. I don't need your Bible. I don't need your Jesus. I don't need your old-time religion. 
uh, I'm, I'm only doing it for the sake of my wife. I'm only doing it for the sake of my girlfriend. I'm only doing it because I want to marry that boy. And uh, he wants me to go to church with him. And, and you know, I'm going along with it. it. It's God's mercy that allows someone to reject the simplicity of the gospel and the offer that Jesus Christ makes to save a sinner that, that keeps God from striking that person down. Let them go on day after day, year after year with that attitude. The Bible says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11. I get, I get by with my sin. I, get, I seem to get away with it today. Uh, I'll try something different tomorrow. The flesh of man is never satisfied. It's never satisfied when it's receiving some, uh, something pleasurable. And it's never satisfied when it thinks it's getting away with doing something wicked. And just like the love of God, the, the, the mercy of God unto salvation is only the, to those who do what God says to do. When the Lord Jesus said, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again, John chapter 3, then a person has to be born again. Peter said, uh, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Acts 4, verse 12. So a person has to trust Jesus Christ. A person has to become born again. That doesn't constitute works on your part. That constitutes obedience. If you simply obey what God says to do, you'll make out all right. If you refuse to do it, say, I don't believe in that. I think it's nonsense. I think it's ridiculous. Then, like I said earlier, you're going to go to hell and you're going to suffer for your sins on your own. If you trust what Christ has already done, the suffering has already taken place. He did it for you. But if you reject that, then you do it one day. And just like the love of God, the mercy of God unto salvation is for those who do what God says to do. Exodus 20, verse 6. God says, And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Fortunately, we're not saved by keeping the commandments of Moses any longer. We're saved by trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. But, but the, 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 the idea of God's mercy transcends Old or New Testament. Turn, to, if you will, to Psalm 103. And I'm just about finished. Psalm 103. Psalm 103, and notice two quick verses there. Verse 11 says, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. In verse 17, But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. Because of time, I'm going to bring this to a close. The Bible shows God to be kind the Bible shows God to be just. The Bible shows God to be jealous as well as being a God of love, uh, a God of holiness, a God of mercy, a God of uh, faithfulness, and so on. God is completely balanced in, his, in himself, in his identity. And um, no one can accuse God of doing wrong because you don't know everything that, every factor, every element that went into that decision. You don't know everything that, that went in to God's decision not to stop the Nazis at Auschwitz, right? You don't know every, every factor, every element in the mind of God that keeps him from just destroying every dictator around this world today. Kent Hovind, and I, you know, he's a decent guy. He's got some good science material. But he did offer this. Uh, a student asked him about uh, God, some debate. And he said, let me ask you something. Do you, obviously you, neither you or I have, have uh, unlimited knowledge about everything in the universe. Neither one of us is omniscient. And the kid was challenging the existence of God. And Ken Hoban said, do you know half of all the available knowledge and information in the universe? And the kid said, obviously, I don't even know half of all the information that is available throughout the cosmos. And Kent Hovind, let's say, that's a fair enough, but let's just suppose you knew half of all that could be known in the universe. Is it possible then that the proof for God exists in the other half that you don't know yet? 
It made the kid have to think, have to stop and think. But God is a balanced being. No one can accuse God of wickedness. No one can accuse him of evil, of being corrupt, of being biased and prejudiced. He will be completely justified and just in every decision he's ever made. And I'm glad that I trusted him as a, as a young boy to save me. And I'm glad that I can believe the scriptures that tell me that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and I'm going to heaven someday. And part of me is already there waiting for this body to be changed and catch up with it. What a wonderful thought that is.